Excellent. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, so let's see if this works. Cool. So you guys have probably all heard of data-driven decision-making, um, the admirable desire to make better decisions through the use of data. And the conventional sort of justification goes something like this. Given the increasing complexity and speed of the world, the globalization and technology that's taking place, um, the only real way to drive impact is to rely on data. And these ideas have percolated across many organizations, from governments to charities, to healthcare, to uh, companies across the world. Um, but in fact, I think they're wrong in principle and misleading in practice, and we can do better. And so that's what I'd like to talk about today. And so if you've been near a business school any time in the last 10 years, you'll have been offered courses like this. And so let's say we were on the fence about whether to do this particular course. Uh, what should we do? We should presumably look at the data. And so in 2022, we're going to generate 100 zettabytes of data. That's 10 to the 23 bytes. So that's every person in the entire world generating a 15 terabyte uh, of data equivalent to the Library of Congress each this year. And of course, that data is only increasing over time. So in 2010, we generated two zettabytes. That's 50 times more uh, this year than we did back then. So let's return to our original question. If I'm going to spend three grand on a course on data-driven decision-making, I want to know it works. But presumably, the ultimate test is whether our organizations have got better with all the extra data that's now around. So naively, one might hope for a 50x increase in performance since 2010. So for those of you in big organizations, hands up if you think the decision maker has got 50 times better over the last decade. Or even like twice, maybe nothing, right? And so that is clearly a bit weird. Um, if you take data-driven decision-making at face value. And to be honest, that the experience of the people in the room today tallies with the experience of senior business leaders, government decision-makers that I speak to. Uh, in many conversations, no one has ever said, oh, this data makes my life so easy. Now I just know all the answers. It's always something more like, it's totally overwhelming, there's far too much data. I don't even know where to start. It's all siloed anyway. Um, and then they'll pause and reflect and they'll be like, hey, you know what, even then, there's Gavin from accounts and he always seems to have data to support his opinion, but I know he's wrong, but he always has the ear of the CEO and there's nothing I can do about it. And so what do I think is happening? Well, I would, as I say, claim that data-driven decision-making is flawed in principle and misleading in practice and it puts the emphasis in the wrong place. Uh, it means organizations focus on the wrong thing. And that's actually not that hard to prove. Oh, we well, can't see it very well, but there's some plot, some data points along here. And let's say these represented my company faculty sales numbers. And the question was, what are we gonna do next? It's not at all obvious. If I ask the finance team, they might project it forward like this and say, you know, uh, take a, some kind of sensible move on average. Now, having founded faculty eight years ago, I know the reality at very best is gonna look something like this with much more real world ups and downs. Of course, when I wake up in the middle of the night, I'm worried about some trajectory like this. And when I speak to my investors, obviously, <laughs> it's definitely gonna turn out like this. But there is a real question here. Which of those lines is correct? What should I plan? on the basis of, if I've got my data, I should be able to make a decision, presumably. Now, fortunately, this isn't the first time humanity has tackled this question. So 400, well, it's been a, basically a central debate in the philosophy of science for 400 years. And the spoiler is that 400 years ago, philosophers of science would have told you that data-driven decision-making was the correct approach. Over time, people gradually found more and more holes in this point of view until in the middle of the 20th century, there was a revolution in how we understood this problem in science. And I'm gonna claim that it's important for other organizations to take a similar journey. So let me explain that. This is Francis Bacon. He was the chancellor for Elizabeth I and early in the tradition of Western inductivists. Um, 
Basically, before the inductivists, people thought that truth came from divine sources. Um, and the inductivists were some of the first people to claim that data was important, which obviously was correct. They thought data itself was sufficient to guide inquiry, establish how the world was, and predict what's going to happen next, a process called induction. They thought that this didn't need any wider theory. Now notice that this is the same claim that data-driven decision-making makes, and that's hard to justify. Will Alpha Centauri appear in the night sky just because it was there yesterday? Well, it was true for a long time, but we know it's not always true. Over time, uh, and at, at, at some point stars burn out, and what was an obvious extrapolation is no longer true. And so famously, David Hume wrote the problem of induction, calling out the flaws in this data-driven approach, uh, but not offering a solution. And it was Karl Popper in the middle of the 20th century um, where we started to get a full picture of how to actually do this. And so this is Karl Popper. He was a British philosopher. And he said that in fact, we don't directly extrapolate from data because that's impossible as we saw in my simple example earlier. What we actually do is we guess a theory of what's going on and then do our best to find the data to falsify that. And this is a crucial shift in emphasis. Suddenly the central focus is the theory, not the data. And it's off the back of the kind of theoretical explanatory model that you can make your predictions. And of course, this means your predictions can be wildly different from a simple extrapolation of, from data. So you can predict that Alpha Centauri is gonna be there for millions and millions of nights in a row, and then the very next night disappear. Uh, and so let's dramatically oversimplify philosophical progress. Um, let's talk about three stages. One, divine truth is everything. Second stage, data is everything. And the third stage, theories are conjectured and then refuted via data. And so what should we take from this? Well, data-driven decision-making is going to fail because it ignores philosophical progress. Outside of science, most other organizations are only partway down the journey. We've made the leap from stage one, divine truths, to stage two, uh, focus on data. You know, we no longer take CEO mandate as enough to just do something. We want to see signs of it in the data, but we haven't taken the leap from data to theories. And so let's make that a bit more concrete. I claim the focus on data-driven decision-making means that we're missing a whole region of the tech stack and a whole set of business processes. So machine learning, particularly causal machine learning, offers us the chance to start having computers help us build models of the world and be able to play with these to see what's likely to happen and what we can do about it. So where are the tools to create these models and improve them over time? Where are our organizational tools to store or how can we interact with them to make better decisions off the bat? The fact that there's actually very little of that that exists demonstrates the sort of myopic focus that just talking about data constantly um, results in the misleading emphasis. And so while you might buy this at a kind of high level, um, you may wonder, does it have any practical implications? How does the future of data points shape my day-to-day -day life? Some kind of curve like, whoop, like this. Well, over the course of COVID, understanding whether a plot like this is going to rapidly accelerate upwards, where it's going to peak and how it's going to tail off has driven decisions that have affected billions of lives and trillions of pounds. So let me take you back to March, 2020, and one single example of the decisions that were being made across the world. So the NHS is a million person organization and it was facing the fastest crisis in its 70 year history. It's probably had to undertake the largest logistical effort of any single organization since World War II. They and the government needed to make life or death decisions on the back of understanding whether curves were trending up or down. And these qu questions matter deeply to all of us. So for the first time ever, we helped them connect the data flows across their entire system. Now, when you're a an organization the scale of the NHS, that is potentially an overwhelming quality, quantity of data. They weren't paralyzed by the torrent, torrent of data that followed. 
they didn't succumb to naive data-led decision-making. Because in a pandemic, that could have been catastrophic. So why was that? Well, working alongside NHS colleagues, uh, we were able to help them apply approaches from the nascent decision intelligence field. We used this data to build an understanding they needed to make confident decisions about which hospital wards to open or close, or which resources like oxygen or ventilators uh, they should send where across the system. That means that rather than just showing them the state of data on current patient demand, we could also show them how much demand they would have tomorrow, how much they'd have next month. And that uh, led to understanding the reasons why demand was changing and how that affected the availability of their resources like beds or nurses and what actions they could take. Rather than making decisions off the back of data alone, they were able to make them based on an understanding of how and why events were unfolding. And it worked. The collective results have been credited with saving thousands of lives. And while faculty has been fortunate enough to receive a lot of praise from this, I do want to emphasize that this is actually a team effort, particularly with the NHS teams. So looking forward beyond this example, we're very excited about the prospects for decision intelligence as one of the most important contemporary applications of AI. Organizations like faculty have built the next generation of technology that will have far reaching consequences for how sophisticated organizations end up making their decisions. And it comes at a much needed time. We need to move beyond the sort of spreadsheet hell of data led decisions. Uh, and we need a revolution in how our decision makers, how our leaders approach decision making. And just as Popper taught us, we need to move instead to decisions based on understanding what we call decision intelligence.